Thank you, everyone, very much. Uh, everybody here live at, uh, in Providence, Rhode Island, at the uh, NGX Next Generation Sequencing Conference, uh, hosted and produced by Cambridge Health Tech Institute, as well as everybody listening online uh, on, the, uh, on the webinar, um, which uh, we're very grateful for you for, you for joining us. We have uh, what I hope will be a very interesting discussion for the next 50 to 60 minutes uh, on a subject that uh, I think a lot of what we're, we have been here, not just this meeting, but uh, in, in, in years leading up to this, uh, the direction that we've been going in, namely the application of genomics to uh, clinical medicine and in particular clinical trials. Um, and the, the focus of this panel is genomics in clinical trials has the time come? Da, 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 da. Um, so before I introduce the subject and introduce our four expert panelists, um, uh, I'm just going to uh, want to thank the two people uh, producing, or the two organizations who are hosting and producing this uh, webcast. This is uh, uh, being produced under the auspices of NGS Leaders, which is an online social uh, community dedicated to next generation sequencing topics. Um, uh, a subsidiary of um, CHI, an assisted company, sister organization to BioIT World, my, my company, um, with nearly 3,000 members that have uh, joined and signed on in the past year. It's an online community offering networking, information, and conversation for people applying genomics in their work in research, uh, whether in academia or private industry. And we hope that you will all uh, join. It's completely free uh, and contribute to that conversation. We're always eager for experts and uh, opinionated people to, uh, to uh, contribute on that site. We're also very grateful to GenomeQuest, and you'll be hearing from GenomeQuest on the panel, uh, a Massachusetts company providing genomic software applications uh, based on whole and multi-genome, uh, it's a whole and multi-genome hosting platform serving the pharmaceutical, agricultural, and biotech industries with expertise not just in NGS data, but also a wealth of uh, intellectual property data uh, as well. You may hear a bit more about them in the uh, ensuing discussion. Um, there's no doubt that uh, genomics applied to clinical trials has uh, immense potential. Uh, the idea being that by stratifying patients into responders, non-responders, and even adverse responders, uh, we can have a profound, uh, profoundly impact the cost of trials and accelerate the, uh, the, the slow, tortuous process of drug development. As the costs of NGS uh, continue to plummet, uh, with data store, the cost of data storage also becoming more manageable, as we've heard earlier this morning. More and more analysis, inference, and interpretation tools coming online, bridging the research and clinical arenas, and a growing volume of validated biomarkers. The question can legitimately be asked, has the time come to reap the rewards of NGS and truly apply this uh, to the process of clinical trials? The problem, in my mind, however, is that while the end point of clinical trials we all want, or most of us presumably want, is this new, this wonderful new uh, uh, utopian era of personalized medicine, until we can really personalize the whole process of clinical trials and the way patients are selected and screened, um, we're going to sort of be chasing our tails to some extent. The, to my knowledge, and maybe the panel has more up-to-date data, the fastest drug that met approval uh, through the FDA uh, was STI-571, better known as Gleevec. Uh, that drug was sequenced in a chemistry lab in Basel in the early 1990s and met FDA approval somewhere around 2001. Of course, it's the Novartis uh, leukemia drug. Uh, but that was a 10-year process to go from small molecule to FDA approval, even when you had one of the most glaring biomarkers you could possibly imagine staring you in the face, namely the Philadelphia uh, rearranged, the rearranged Philadelphia chromosome. Um, we'd all love to develop those biomarkers and apply them to, to uh, patients uh, and clinical trial volunteers, but the question is how can we, how can we do that and to what extent will NGS uh, play a role? Obviously, many of us have a vested interest in this. Um, so uh, without further ado, because I want to now get the, ex the input of our four guests uh, on our panel, uh, uh, I, I'll give them a brief bio and then I'll have them uh, say a little bit more about themselves, their interests and sort of an opening statement, and then we'll dig into some, some questions. And of course, as we go through, I'm looking uh, eagerly to the audience uh, that I can see for their own uh, questions, and we'll hopefully take a few questions uh, online using the interactive WebEx uh, platform and maybe even from Twitter as well. So I'm joined on the panel here by Aya Khalil, Brad Smith, Richard Resnick, and Toby Bloom. So taking them in order, uh, for those of you who uh, us can see, uh, next closest to me on your left is Richard Resnick, who is the CEO of GenomeQuest. 
uh, company he joined in 2008 and has been CEO for, I think, a couple of years now. Uh, he took his bioinformatics training during the heyday of the Human Genome Project from one Eric Land and his colleagues, uh, and then moved into the private sector and has worked in a number of life sciences um, organizations, uh, including uh, he was the CEO of Mosaic Bioinformatics and also Global Bioinformatics Software Head for WIRE. It's always a pleasure to welcome um, uh, Richard. Um, next to Richard is Brad Smith, um, and Brad is really our clinical guru here on the panel. Brad is the Vice President of Translational Medicine at Quintiles, one of the world's most successful global clinical research organizations. Brad works with pharma and biotech companies to create programs for cancer drug development and use with a focus on personalized medicine. He previously led corporate development at Cell Signaling Technology. Um, so uh, Brad is uh, someone who's been thinking, who you know, wakes and, and goes to sleep presumably thinking about how uh, genomics technologies and NGS sequencing uh, can really be applied to this problem. So it's a great pleasure to welcome uh, uh, Brad uh, for, and to, to have him taking time out to be here. And then uh, uh, two, two charming ladies on the panel. Uh, first, Aya Khalil, who is the um, Executive Vice President and Co-Founder of GNS Healthcare, formerly Gene Network Sciences in Cambridge. The company has been run uh, by Ayer and colleagues for uh, the past 10 years. Um, uh, Ayer is a physicist by training, but uh, she and her colleagues apply reverse engineering and in silico simulations of large-scale genetic and biochemical networks to identify new leads and greater efficiencies in drug development. Uh, she was uh, educated at Cornell and briefly served as the landlord to another well-known NGS startup, Pacific Bioscience. It's a little-known fact there. Uh, and last but not least, uh, Toby Bloom. Uh, the folks in the audience here have already heard from, from Toby this morning. Uh, Toby is the uh, Director of Informatics for the Genome Sequencing Platform at the Broad Institute, of course, uh, the, the largest genome center in the United States and North America. She has the uh, small uh, manageable task of managing all software development for NGS operations at the Broad, where she's been for about a decade um, and has extensive experience in the software development industry before that. And while uh, Toby's day job isn't to worry about uh, uh, clinical trials. Uh, she knows more than uh, most about how to analyze and manage vast amounts of genome data and uh, I think has some, some prior experience sort of interfacing with clinical organizations. So uh, we're very glad, glad to have them all here. Perhaps we can get a round of applause for our panel and thank them for their time. Thank you. So let me start in order of uh, appearance and introduction and just say a very brief words, because I've already given a quick introduction about your, your companies, and just a sort of an opening a few thoughts uh, about uh, how you see uh, the world of NGS uh, and its potential uh, interface uh, with streamlining and personalizing and expediting clinical trials. So Richard, I know you're battling a, a bug uh, whose genome has yet to be decoded, but uh, thanks for, for braving it and uh, sure. uh, all yours. I also picked the wrong day to quit smoking cigarettes, it turns out. But um, So I'm the, I'm the CEO of GenomeQuest. Uh, GenomeQuest is an 11-year-old company in the genomic industry. We're a software company at the core. I don't want to make a, a GenomeQuest commercial right now. Um, but what I will say is that having supplied research uh, pipeline applications to pharma, ag, bio, biotech, and hospitals over the past couple of years, Something very surprising happened about a year ago. A number of the um, hospitals and the labs that are, that are doing sequence-based diagnostics said, hey, there's a technology here which is about 100 million times cheaper and faster than what we used to use, Sanger sequencing, and maybe we should take a look at it. And if we can go deeply enough, if we can sequence deeply enough, it may be that forgetting about looking at the whole genome, forgetting about sort of the, the problem that Zach uh, elucidated in his talk, what if we just probe the exact same 50 variants that we keep looking at using Sanger sequence and just did it more cheaply, maybe even just as an adjunct, as a screen of some kind? Well, that, is that a cost-saving mechanism? And so since then, if you do a search on Google every single week, type, for, type the word clinical diagnostics, next generation sequencing, and you'll see new things every single week. There's now 50, 100 labs that are all saying that they're doing it or intend to do it. And so that's exploded, guys, in the past year. The question as to whether this is employable in clinical trials uh, for patient stratification, I think you run into some of Zach's issues. Um, but certainly as a replacement technology for the old way of sequencing, 
it's there today, and that's enabling us to learn more about the technology. So I'm very excited to uh, be part of the panel. Looking forward to talking to you all. Okay. Brad from Brad Smith from Quintiles. Yes. Uh, I'm Brad Smith, and I'm from Quintiles. Quintiles is the, the largest CRO. Uh, we're about 24,000 employees in 65 countries. So we touch just about every drug under development. Um, if you look back, uh, the top drugs approved in cardiovascular, oncology, CNS in the last few years, we basically worked on every one of them. So the, the, the reach of Quintiles into the healthcare system and into the clinical trials is, is tremendous. Um, we are a CRO, and we tend to be the, the arms and legs of trials um, rather than the brains, and that's a challenge. Um, Quintiles recognizes that the industry, the drug development industry, and um, by that the CRO industry as well is facing a critical challenge right now in terms of productivity. I'm sure everybody has seen the graphs of R&D investment versus new drugs approved. And so Quintiles has taken a number of different approaches in addressing that challenge, and one of them is certainly new technologies and new trial designs, adaptive trial design, modeling, operation, um, that certainly fit what next-gen sequencing um, may offer. We've also taken a, an approach where we really try to uh, chart out what it's going to look like. And so I'm a member of a group within Quintiles called Innovation. We're really charged to be the skunk works. We're really trying to understand uh, what it's going to look like. How do we develop a virtual drug development team? and uh, have the right pieces there, be able to establish our network of, of suppliers, vendors, and partners. But also, how do we offer a higher value product to the customer? And this is where we get into higher level uh, risk-based partnerships and where we start to be able to take on some of the drug development internally. And this is an opportunity also to start to really explore some of the um, new technologies and really address some of the challenges. Because when we look at next-gen sequencing, for a CRO, it, it really is like um, what, the, what Zach talked about. We need to be able to reach the standards of the clinician. And so technical validation and clinical validation become very, very important. And if the technology doesn't reach those standards, it, it has very little chance of being adopted within our system and by our customers. So uh, I hope we can talk a bit more about those challenges and also about the promise. Great. Aya Khalil from GNS Healthcare, welcome. Thank you. And thanks for having me on the panel. Um, so it's no doubt in my mind that we're in the era of big data, but it's not just big data as in petabytes of sequencing data, but it's also complex data. So it's not just your genome that matters and that characterizes the disease and your response to treatment, but it's also your phenome, both on the molecular level as well as the physiological level. And so to me, today's challenge is about how do you integrate those types of measurements and those types of data in real-world clinical trials and observational type situation so that you can actually uh, turn biology into a predictive field um, as opposed to a descriptive field and the tools that are needed to do that. And so our focus has been on taking machine learning tools, reverse engineering tools, analytical tools, um, and marrying them with high performance supercomputing because you need to actually analyze data on that scale to actually make sense of it so that we can learn models underlying the system in an unbiased way directly from the data and then use these models to actually um, come up with predictions and insights as to who the responders for a drug might be and what are the markers that predict that or the non-responders or hypotheses around combination therapies. So for the last few years, I've watched um, sort of pharma companies and biotech companies go from sort of being averse to using uh, gene expression arrays, sequencing technologies, and clinical trials to now feeling like, yeah, they need to understand what their drugs are doing in these patients. And so they're going out, they're collecting the data, and now the challenge is, is how, to actually, how do you actually make sense of the data? And we've been doing several projects now that actually show that it's actually possible to take that data and identify who would actually benefit from serpent therapy, starting from these large-scale measurements that look at thousands, hundreds of thousands of components to then distilling it to something that can predict outcomes in patients. Hopefully we can hear a bit more. I don't know if you would classify these as success stories, but they're certainly promising stories. We'll get into some of those in a little bit. And uh, last but not least, Toby Bloom from the Broad Institute. Hi. <clears throat> so, so I run informatics for the sequencing center at the Broad now. I know a little bit about clinical trials because 10 years ago before I came to the Broad, I was a chief technology officer at a clinical informatics company. Um, so I know something about the structure of clinical trials, but, but we've been 
you know, we've been involved in the Broad at looking at very, very large numbers of samples and, and trying to figure out the very early on statistical associations between ch variants in those samples um, and, and diseases. We'd, of course, like to see it get to the clinic. Um, I'm, not, I, I'm not sure what other hurdles are between having those very large numbers of samples where we can pick through them and say the quality of the sample isn't quite good enough. Um, we're going to throw this one out. Um, or we can validate this three different ways. Um, and and not, having, not having that kind of flexibility and not having the open-ended research components that we have now. And, and, and I'm not quite sure what all the steps are to get there, but we'd certainly like to see it happen, and, and as soon as possible. Okay, great. Um, usually when we have panels like this, we say you know, for the very last question, okay, let's jump forward five years and you know, what's, what's, look into your crystal ball and tell us what the situation is going to be. I sort of want to start with that. I mean, the whole premise of this is that genomics and next-gen sequencing is going to have down the road, um, not today, uh, maybe not next year, but down the road in the not too distant future, a significant impact on the process of clinical trials. So I want to sort of go there, and then we can work back and start thinking about how do we get there. But I just want to get a, see if we're on the same page as to what there looks like, if you follow me. If we assume that next-gen sequencing with all of the new technologies we're going to hear at this conference and in next year's conference, third-generation, fourth-generation platforms are going to make it cheaper, faster, better. The accuracy is going to go from four nines to five nines to six nines. Um, we're going to not just get to the $1,000 genome, but the $110 genome, which we'll, claims we'll probably hear about at this conference from somebody or other. Um, uh, once we get to that point, um, and Pharma and, and, and their CRO partners are just jumping to deploy this technology, is this really going to be um, uh, as, as good as advertised? Is this really going to result in better, more uh, uh, streamlined patient recruitment, improved decision-making, and just faster, cheaper clinical trials. I'll start with Brad first. Well, if I had to, to look in the crystal ball, and, and what we're working towards now, or hope to be working towards, is, is uh, a situation where we'll have pools of patients that are pre-screened, and we'll have um, a number of different pharma customers um, already signed up. So when we get a protocol, and um, we understand that we want to find these patients, and it may be for a very small niche um, indication, or it may be a small subgroup of a larger indication, that we already have the patients uh, for that trial, and we're able to recruit very quickly into the trial. It, it may be a, a participant-driven trial. We may not need the sites. We may go directly to the patients. Um, but we're able to recruit very quickly. It may be an adaptive trial design, so we can find out very fast whether those markers really uh, predict response or not, and we can tailor. And then we can uh, find a patient that, say, doesn't work on this drug, but is positive for something else, so we can switch them over to another drug, which requires that we're working with multiple companies in that situation. But I think that, that's what we really would hope to achieve. There's, there's obviously many challenges to that, but, but that certainly is what we're looking for. And you think that would be sequenced before they even see a drug? Yes, well, that's one of the challenges is, is what do you profile? Do you profile for the markers that you know about now or for the markers that are becoming? Um, and um, that's one of the questions we have. Is sequencing going to address one of those? And how do we standardize that across all these different studies? Uh, Richard, I, uh, Toby, so NGS is not the bottleneck. It's just really kicking ass. Uh, what, what's, how do you then see uh, your engagement with the clinical uh, uh, ecosystem. Um, so, so look, I mean, I think you, you listen to BPU translational medicine at pharma A, B, C, or D, and they all talk about the data overfit problem, the same thing that Zach said. That is, <laughs> excuse me, you take, um, if you have sort of enough things that you're measuring, enough people that you're measuring, you ask what their, the first initial, their middle name, the last digit of their zip code, and what their mom's favorite color is, and 3,000 other data points, and you're going to find some way to predict some outcome. And then if you do it again the next time, you'll find some perfectly other reasonable way to predict some outcome. There's too much data. I think that's a real problem, and one that we may never ultimately be able, be able to overcome by simply using every single measurement. And so I think NGS is interesting for the following reason. 
there are 30-something, 40 biomarkers for cancer right now that we can probe for today. Why not sequence the whole genome to probe for them? Why would you do that? Because as a pharmaceutical company, what you're now doing is you're building up a knowledge base. Now, you may only be powering your trial against some of those biomarkers. Nevertheless, you're probing the entire genome for a long period of time across thousands of patients. That ultimately is driving better target discovery, validation, better drugs, and the number of those biomarkers slowly increases. So what's really cool about NGS, I think, in this context is that it is a self-correcting vehicle. That is, it has the ability to replace existing probes today and to teach itself through the power of many people and many tasks how to grow that, that sort of presence, that database of biomarkers. So uh, NGS is no longer the bottleneck. That's it's, right. it's what you do. Yeah. <laughs> That's right. It's what we do. So when you say it's no longer the bottleneck, in my mind, then you're using something like a next-gen sequencing not only to do and get DNA variation, but also to look at the transcriptome, microRNA, to look at both molecular measures as well. It's actually the two that I think are really important. Um, and then so once that you have that, you asked about the vision. So the vision is, is that, yeah, everybody does get profiled um, if we're talking about uh, uh, things like RA or whatnot, then, you know, you're going to look at germline mutations and, and sequences and maybe transcriptome in the blood and other tissue types. If you're talking about cancer, then you're going to look at actual tumor tissue and variation in tumor. Um, and so then the question is, is what do you do with that data? So I'll always be coming back to that. Uh, but that is where then the focus needs to be on the analytics and analytical tools that allow you uh, to take in that data and actually make sense of it via predictive models. And so the vision is, is that we actually create a pipeline that addresses the problem end to end. So not only the data collection, which is getting your um, sequence thread, your transcriptome, microRNA, but also other types of um, measurements that are important for your, for your phenome, whether it's physiological outcomes, et cetera, all um, measured and categorized in a database, all the way to that analytical layer, that software layer that then produces outcomes and predictions for you. And that's how the system, in my mind, plays out end to end in terms of the final vision. And Toby, before I come to you, Brad, just to that point, are you thinking about that sort of the big world of omics? It's not just about getting a whole, a whole genome sequence, you've got to layer it in to, and integrate it with all of this other stuff. Well, I would say that uh, at its essence, um, Quintiles at least is a, is a data company. It was founded by a statistician and, and what at least 10,000 of our employees who are CRAs, they go out to the study sites and collect data and then they enter into a database. Um, and so much of our activities are around how to um, collect, store, and analyze the clinical data. And um, we're just now starting to think about, well, boy, maybe we better start thinking about the stream of data coming in from genomics. Um, and so I'd say we're just starting to think about that now. Okay, we'll pick up that thought. Toby, did you want to weigh in on the previous? Um, I, I think most of it's been said already. I mean, I think once we have, once the cost isn't the factor in getting the sequencing done, um, I'm not sure if you said that the accuracy wasn't a factor, but there's I'm still this question of whether you understand everything you've really got and you really understand what data you have. And then it's a question of, yeah, all of the different types of data. It's not going to be just whole genome data. Yeah. There's going to be expression data and a whole bunch of data you have to integrate as yeah. the next step in analysis. Yeah. Let's bring it back now to sort of the more of the present day. Brad, you certainly, Richard, I know, and Aya, I know, you are engaging, talking to, working with pharma customers all the time. You must have had many official and you know, casual discussions about how they are going to leverage NGS. You must have a, 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 an inkling or a very good idea of what some of their issues, what some of their concerns are with regard to just jumping in and, and either you know, working with, uh, with uh, uh, building their own uh, next-gen sequencing center or sending stuff off to, to uh, BGI or Compute Genomics or one of the other outsourcing companies. So uh, if, if there is hesitation or concerns or, or, or there are some funding blocks, what are they? Is it a matter of cost? Is it a matter of accuracy, as we've just touched on? Is it that they want to keep the data in-house, but they don't have the, they're scared of the infrastructure and the IT that goes with it? Is it the security and the confidentiality and the privacy of their data? Uh, help us sort of understand where, where are the stumbling blocks that are sort of preventing a farmer from jumping in with both feet. Brad, I'll start with you again. Sure. Um, no, we, we definitely see uh, a number of challenges, and one of them certainly is, is that uh, 
the requirements for validation, for technical validation, clinical validation are very high. Um, we have a large central lab. Um, all of our labs are, are CLIA, including the ones in China, uh, across, around the world. And so um, when we produce data, develop data, and report it in a database, it has to be at the standards. You go to the FDA or the NAVE, so it has to be at a very high level. And, and so when we introduce a new technology into our laboratory, that's the first hurdle. We have to convince the, the directors of those laboratories that this really is going to deliver um, robust data. Um, I think you know, one of the challenges there is that the technologies are continuing to change. And, and so our laboratories have been very hesitant to jump in and invest because the next day that platform could be obsolete. Um, so I think those are some of the challenges. And, and certainly cost, um, when we get involved at a partnership level with a pharma in terms of a drug development program, we're working on oncologists. And they're thinking about a lot of things. And biomarkers and um, lab tests are usually pretty far down the list. So if you come in and propose something that may add some cost to their budget, even though it may be a very small percentage, or may also put their trial at risk. For example, you suggest some new endpoints. They may be exploratory endpoints, but still, if they see that as a risk to their trial and reaching their primary endpoint, then they're going to be very hesitant to, to add that to the trial protocol. Richard. Oh, man. I mean, <laughs> you know, we, I guess I could talk a lot about it. I think, in general, what I would say is that the thing that strikes me most uh, clearly, the clock speed of product development in pharma is something like 12 years, right? And the clock speed of other industries is far faster if you're running a website like Facebook or Twitter, or if you have a restaurant and you're the chef, you're changing your products or envisioning new changes on a nightly basis. And that clock speed, that like slow, plodding, expensive clock speed, juxtaposed against the technological innovation which is happening, and I've done this research faster than any other piece of technology has ever developed in the history of mankind, they just don't fit. Pharma's going to take a long time to take this stuff up. And in fact, I think that it's the pull from the pathologists and the clinical geneticists who are on the ground. It's the pull from real patients who are saying, I've got a rare, undiagnosed form of leukodystrophy, and I don't know how I'm going to live to be two years old. Or, you know, no psoriasis drug works for me. I think that's really where it's going to be. And I think, frankly, if I um, had enough money, I'd probably start a pharma company, because I think there's a, there's, it's a good time for a new business model there. But I do think that at the risk of those of us who are in the pharmaceutical industry and who maybe even are my customers, I think that um, there's a new way of thinking about how to approach this stuff from the perspective of building knowledge bases and then using those in conjunction with the kinds of stuff that I and her company do to really build out these models and build better drugs. I think, I think you must be a little high on Dayquil or something if you <laughs> want to start a pharma company. <laughs> but, uh, if I could say that, perhaps, you know, one example of that, a new model would be foundation. Right. Yeah. And you look at, for example, the study that the MMRF, Multi Myeloma Research Foundation, just announced last week. A thousand patients, eight years, uh, full genomic um, analysis, including RNA seq, right. uh, whole genome, whole exon. Um, that is going to be an incredible amount of data and source. and that Foundation is focused on drug development, advancing drug development. Hi, we're so, talking about uh, you know, farmers' view of this and what, yeah. what are the stumbling blocks. I think um, the major stumbling block is actually that success story. So who's actually taken this technology combined with analytics and actually shown that they can develop a drug faster, better. So um, I, they, you said that the Wevax was the fast, was, wasn't the ELK inhibitor? How fast was that? I thought that was the fastest. Okay. Okay. Like, that's an old story. So yeah, maybe yeah, yeah. So that, that was yeah. like the, the darling story of, of last, last year's ASCO, right? So they had found, uh, you know, this ELK translocation mutation or whatnot, and then they, actually the drug was originally a CMET drug, found out that it actually inhibited ELK, and so that, oh, lo and behold, when you applied it to this subpopulation, it works, and then in record time, they got the drug approved. So the industry needs some kind of story like that. Of course, that was all serendipity. You know, Pfizer got lucky. Uh, good for them. But we know that there's actually a more rational way to do this that can work. I mean, there's no reason why what we're talking about in terms of um, the science of it um, and how it plays out, why you can't go in and now profile these patients and discover these things um, and do the right analytics on it to actually do that discovery. But it is going to be a success story. And the question is, is who's going to, 
take a chance on that pilot that actually shows that this can work. Um, and I think there are folks within pharma who are willing to do that, but it's going to take a while to actually show that. And Toby, are you? I don't work with the, at least the clinical side of pharma these days. We work some with the discovery yeah. side, so I, you know, I don't have a lot to add. Uh, okay, Brad, uh, just going back to the CRO now, as as you said, I think you said the, the world's largest CRO, Quintiles. But whether you want to talk about Quintiles in specifically or the industry as a whole, I, I, are you? You know, building an NGF center yourself, is this something that you have to have ownership with, or would you potentially work with uh, some of the outfits that I mentioned a little earlier? No, like I said, we do have a central lab, and our, our, um, our preference is to have it in-house um, because of control of the, 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 the quality of the data and for integration um, into all of our other systems. But um, we do have um, some genomic capabilities, certainly. We do quite a bit of genotyping and, and uh, we have a, a lab for solid tumor analysis in Chicago that actually now has a sequinome. We'll be doing that shortly. Um, but in terms of investing internally in further capabilities right now, um, we're really probably looking more towards, as the field develops and partnering, um, um, bringing it in-house as things mature and as the validation levels grow. Um, and I think that certainly Covance and, and the Rosetta um, example, you know, may suggested taking a you know, slightly more advanced approach, although one of the challenges is integration, and I understand that it's been a challenge for integration with COVAS and, and the Rosetta. Excellent. Um, just to say, just to remind people uh, who are listening that we are roughly halfway through our discussion on genomics in clinical trials. Uh, has the time come? Brought to you by uh, NGS leaders, the uh, online social community dedicated to NGS uh, uh, technology and applications, uh, and, and our friends at GenomeQuest. Um, we've had uh, some uh, questions uh, from the uh, uh, listeners to the webcast, which we're very grateful for. Keep them coming. We'll try to squeeze in as many as we can. Uh, I've got three here, and I'll certainly throw in the first one now. Um, I don't know who this is from, but uh, what are the regulatory challenges in incorporating sequencing data into clinical trials? How is the data reported and explained? Brad, I'm going to look at you again, since you're the closest to this, perhaps. <laughs> well, we, we do have a regulatory group, and uh, I'm not, not, a, not a member of that group, so I'm not an expert on the, on the regulatory. Um, typically, the type of genomic analysis we do right now are exploratory endpoints. Um, we have a few examples where we've done prospective patient selection based upon a single mutation, um, and this is all done in a CLIA lab, um, and so those would go into a FDA submission. Um, we also are involved in some diagnostic development. For example, we did some of the reproducibility studies for the um, Roche COBAS system that was used for the um, Dobras BRAF inhibitor melanoma. Um, so uh, certainly we're involved in that, but in terms of the challenges of, of, of say, multi-analyte um, signatures, you know, how the FDA is going to handle that, um, I don't know if anybody knows. Okay. Anyone else want to comment on what they see as potential regulatory challenges in incorporating NGS data into clinical trials? No? I, I mean, so it's general? No, no. no, no I, go ahead. Go ahead. Yeah, I'm not. Um, I, all I know is I, I spoke to an unnamed gent at the FDA who was really disappointed about the fact that pharma is not submitting genomic data through the Voluntary Genomic Data Exchange Program. Um, uh, probably for good reasons, by the way, if you're a pharma company, right? But nevertheless, I mean, the FDA in some way is just trying to keep up, just like pharma does. Their clock speeds are about as fast, mm -hmm. and um, the technology is moving just as quickly as it can. And so it's clearly, as Brad said, put some stakes in the ground around what and how they are going to regulate CLIA labs doing multi-analyte tests, and they intend to do that. Uh, whether or not and to what degree the actual genomic data will be employed for, you know, for the actual sort of um, endpoint discovery and the end, I mean, those I think are much bigger questions that is probably the reason why pharma at large is not asking Brad and Covance and other folks to jump into the genomic revolution as quickly as um, folks, say, in hospitals running CLIA labs are. Is there anything that the community should be doing to smooth this process, or is it just up to farmers to incorporate it and submit it and, sit and, and sort of then engage in that dialogue with FDA? Well, I would, I would say um, we 
certainly have challenges that are that are that are broader, um, such as guidance on the co-development of drugs, companion diagnostics, and drugs. I mean, that guidance just came out in in July from the FDA, and it calls for us to start putting those plans into our drug development um, plans that we submit, and and that's created a big challenge. That's not something that we've been doing in the past. So our lab our laboratories typically don't get involved in that, um, but now they're going to have to start thinking about that. You know, how is it going to work in their drug development plans if you have to think about your companion diagnostic from the very beginning, and how are you going to translate that research test into a diagnostic in a phase three or post-approval? Um, I think there, there are certain things that can be done to accelerate the adoption of, of sure. MGS in, sure. in our laboratory, certainly, and, and some of the things are standardization of data management, and, um, analysis and access. For example, we'd be very interested in, in DA integrator and some of the uses of that. And, and for example, um, iSpy and the Transcend um, program that we built to, to exchange all, collect the data, exchange the data, make the data access, and, and that's hmm. a very interesting trial. Um, and then technology development and, and really helping us understand the technologies. I mean, what are the critical um, performance characteristics? Is it coverage? Is it calls? Read link. I mean, I, I'm not an expert. Mm. My background is not in molecular biology, but these are the variables that I have to start to understand now. Obviously, in the time frame of a clinical trial, which is years, waiting a week or two weeks for a run, that's, you know, that's not the problem. In, in other applications, it obviously it is, but that's not the problem. But what about, uh, do you have misgivings over the current cost? Do you need to see that come down significantly? And what about accuracy? I'd like to have a quick discussion about where the accuracy needs to go for a clinical context versus where it currently stands in the, in the research context, and the amount of co uh, sequence coverage that you're going to need to, to uh, 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 you know, be, be satisfied that the, the trial can go ahead? Anyone? Sure. So um, yes, accuracy is important. And actually being able to show that you can take this next-gen sequencing assay and have it replace um, whatever, whatever it is you're doing that does genotyping now, whatever it is you're doing that does gene expression analysis or microRNA chip, that's one. Um, showing that it's reproducible and then that you can deal with batch-to-batch -batch problems. So if you're trying to come up with a um, a biomarker program for your drug and you're starting to, so you've decided to collect the samples in your phase one, phase two, phase three, you're going to now sequence all of it. If you can't compare your data sets between phase one, two, and three, you know, that's essentially mm. going to be a wash there and you're not going to be able to leverage the power of the studies that you're doing. Mm. So that's something that the technology has to address and I think once it does, that certainly will drive adoption. Um, so I think cost is important, but again, if you have a success story, I don't think that that's going to be the barrier. Um, that right. you know, once you show that it can work, people will do right. this. Right. Toby, do you want to talk a little bit about sequence accuracy and what, where you see the, uh, um, the trend? Yeah, I'm. I'm not sure I can talk about the trend. I mean, I, I. We're working really hard to get to the point where we can say we have good enough accuracy for the clinic, but we're not there yet. Um, but accuracy is is very tricky. Um, all of the technologies we have now have biases of one sort or another. Um, they're not all the same. Um, and so you get, you get non-random errors that we have to account for. Um, and we spend a lot of time, and, and, and the number of samples you need and the amount of data you need to be accurate right now is really quite high. And, and so it's, it's I think we have, I think there are ways we're making progress. I, go ahead. Well, you say uh, as far as clinical grade sequence accuracy, we're not there yet. However, there's a company we're going to hear from at the conference later this afternoon, Foundation Medicine, we were talking about them offline, uh, founded by a group of uh, well-known uh, mm -hmm. uh, Harvard and MIT and Broad uh, uh, cancer specialists who will hope to launch next year, next summer, a, a, a full clinical uh, specimen uh, patient sample uh, next-gen sequencing mm -hmm. assay uh, for 300, I believe, of the most uh, commonly mutated cancer genes, um, and they will get around accuracy using, I mean, they're currently obviously using the best technologies that they currently have, but one, reason, one way they'll get around it is by not stopping at 30-fold, but maybe going to 100, 200, 400-fold mm -hmm. to ensure that there isn't a false positive. We, so going, going deep enough? 
um, a lot of the analytic tools we have to correct for some of the inaccuracies and can find them and detect them with deep enough coverage yeah. will help with that. You're also talking there about, what did you say, 30 markers? Right? 300 genes. 300 genes. Yeah. Yeah. Um, you know, you can, you can, there are some that are easier to deal with than others. There are regions of the genome that are easier to deal with, with other, than others. Um, all of those affect it. And, and, you know, yes, I mean, I'm not saying we're not going to get there. Um, I think we're getting there, but there's still questions of accuracy that, that have to be answered. Um, I want to uh, just see if we have any success stories that the panel wants to share, and then we'll take a question from the audience. So uh, make yourself known to, to Mary Ann if you would like to uh, pose a question for the panel. But we've talked about success stories as being something that would be good to have. Um, I'm wondering where you would, what examples might you point to, either from your own organizations or from uh, the industry as a whole, where you say, yeah, this is a good example of the way the field needs to go. Let me start with you, Aya, and then we'll go around the panel. Sure. So uh, we're working with oncology, uh, leading oncology companies right now to help them do patient stratification since that's actually the one area that where it's really clear that you have a lot of these targeted therapies and we still don't know who they're going to work for or who they won't work for. That's just as important as figuring out. Um, and so we're getting data sets coming in from early trials where they're looking at baseline um, measurements of transcriptome or microRNA or mutations. And what we've been able to do is fairly quickly take in those data sets, which are large, still not as large as what you'd get in NGS, but we're still talking about 50,000 transcripts, um, you know, and, and hundreds of molecular markers that normally get measured, along with other things like patient history, uh, what therapies they're on, their blood pressure, as well as the outcomes in terms of response uh, to that drug, whether it's looking at percent tumor change or progression-free survival. And taking those complex data set and within uh, weeks actually coming around and coming up with uh, combinations of biomarkers, not just a, a sort of single marker, um, single variant analysis, but a multivariate analysis that explains what combinations of both your genotype, transcripts, as well as other clinical measures actually predict response to treatment. Um, we're now in the phase of actually uh, have shown that we can at least validate these in um, preclinical studies and other out-of-sample tests and where the collaborator now is confident enough to actually take those and actually use that as part of their strategy, patient selection strategy, for a phase two or phase three. So hopefully the big success will come when the end of the trial they can then show um, that by using those combination of markers that were arrived by doing this thorough, um, uh, using this machine learning approach for analyzing the data, using high performance supercomputing and coming up with these models that so they can then come up with predictive markers over time. And are you, are you coming in after the trial has started when there's already some data has been collected so that you can take that the one big pool and then start to uh, stratify it? Exactly. So they'll collect, the, they will ahead of time recognize that they want to have a patient stratification strategy, so they'll collect the samples, analyze the data. Once there's enough sufficient data from one phase of the trial, we then do the analysis and that gets used to inform the next stage. Okay. Other success stories? Go ahead. Well, I, I would say that Quintiles, in terms of success stories, probably right now is really um, a couple of examples where we put together the system so when we have the biomarkers, um, we're able to use them in a clinical trial, take them through early phase and late phase and all the way into a companion diagnostic and get co-approval. Um, so we have a couple of examples, one with, with AstraZeneca and DACA where we're taking some markers forward and this actually is a fish test. Um, all the way from a very early research test at AstraZeneca to a clinical trial test at, at Quintiles to a final kit at DACO all the way through. So we can plug something in there. Um, but outside of that, I think Krizotinib obviously is a great example. But we know there that, again, there's challenges in terms of the companion diagnostic. Perhaps FISH isn't the best method. Um, but also we're seeing institutes and companies come to us who, have, who are using whole genome sequencing, for example, and they're having some success in identifying, matching up a patient with a drug. And they're coming to us and saying, look, we're, we've able, been able to do that, and we have a really hard time saying, well, how does this translate into a clinical trial? Um, how does it scale? And I think that, that's the, you know, the big challenge we see right now. Richard, <laughs> you've got some success stories. Well, they're all invented. No, um, there's lots of little ones. I was talking about the big one, you yeah. know, and that one I don't think it has happened yet, right? There's lots right. of little ones, like yeah. working on a compound phase four, trying to find the biomarkers that drive 
a certain set of adverse events. We've seen that. I mean, if you ask Novartis, you ask Michael Nohaley why he bought Genoptics. Have you asked him? I haven't. Okay, you should. Because the reason why he did, obviously, when you look at all the, at all the press, they're clearly in the business of building companion diagnostics, but also standalone diagnostics. And the way in which they're going to do that, among other things, is by using sequence. Um, what we've started to do on this, uh, inside of Genome Quest is really sort of move far downstream of that. And so, as I said earlier, we're now working with the real physicians, the real diagnosticians that are running not so much whole genome sequence yet, but more exome and gene panels on a variety of multigenic disorders. And we're just helping them to replace Sanger sequence panels with next generation sequence panels at at least 100x, if not two or 300x coverage. And then to help them validate it in a clear context and then to help them aggregate that data over time. What's happening as a result of that is that there are patients who are getting very clear diagnoses on the variants that we sort of know are clinically actionable inside of a disease. But then there are also all these other variants that we're uncovering, the so-called variants of unknown significance. Now, if pharma and if the CROs don't push down the path of trying to build new therapeutics that are tightly coupled with genetic diagnostics, then I'm reasonably certain that these labs, these clinical geneticists, these pathologists, as they aggregate this data, will figure it out themselves. They know what the drugs are that are out there, and they'll just prescribe something based on some sort of a classification that they've done under the CLIA context. The FDA can bark or not about it if they want to, but this is the way that I think genomics is fundamentally going to disrupt the entire pharma value chain, the entire diagnostic value chain. So I think that's the real big success story. That won't happen for a couple more years. Toby, do you want to anything, anything to add? Or if not a success story in terms of uh, uh, deployment of NGS in clinical trials, you certainly have uh, sort of the best practices, I would suggest, in terms of you know, managing thousands of, of genomes. And uh, you, you, you're learning... Uh, some of the some of the tricks and how to compress the data, uh, which is presumably is a, is a challenge that uh, uh, Brad and Quintiles and, and farmers are going to face very very soon. Um, I'm not sure what you're asking me. <laughs> I'm asking um, you to comment on uh, uh, just challenges of managing that vast amount of, of data. Which um, I think very much what I said earlier today. By the time I hope this gets to large-scale use in clinical trials. You'll be keeping around the variants, not the raw data, and that, that will eliminate that problem. That will also possibly eliminate some of the problems with keeping anonymity of the participants, which if you have all of the raw data, it's, it's harder to do and raises questions that, that I suspect will maybe also be regulatory questions. Um, but I think, you know, I think we have to get to that point where, you know, if you're doing um, deep enough coverage with accurate enough technologies that, that you can be sure that the variants you called are variants and, and we're getting down to the analysis of what do those variants mean, then, then the data storage isn't, isn't the issue anymore. Um, okay. Any questions from uh, our audience uh, in front of me, live, uh, looking around? Yes, we have one here. Please introduce yourself. Um, Chris Omrich, John Hopkins University. Um, I think it's really only a matter of time until uh, everybody will have their genomes. You know, neonatally you test for a handful of diseases nowadays, but pretty soon you'll be able to do this, the genome at that point. What I don't see yet is where and how you can, on a broad scale, close the feedback loop of pharmacological outcomes for these patients mm -hmm. as they, you know, when you doctor tries to decide to treat blood pressure with either, either a diuretic or a beta blocker, you want to be able to capture those outcomes and feed that back. And that, I don't really see those structures yet. Brad, where are those structures? <laughs> well, that's an interesting point. Into Mike, I think within, within the CRO, you know, perhaps there we do have real-time reporting. Um, but that, that's hidden information. That's information that goes into a, a trial and reported to the pharma company. And, and so certainly within, for example, the innovation group, um, we've explored how to get access to a lot of that information. 
Um, some of it we have been able to get access to, and for example, we're working with a company called Archimedes to, to do some healthcare modeling. Um, certainly there's a lot of interest in, in developing the payer as our customer to again take advantage of that information. But like you said, there's some big gaps that uh, around say uh, pharmacogenomics and drug metabolism and dosage that uh, are some obvious, I would think, opportunities to really impact um, patient response and drug development. I think we have the problem now with drugs in general of not collecting enough data about how patients are really reacting to the drugs both positively or negatively. And it may get worse with genomic data, but I, I think it's, it's the same problem. We aren't collecting the feed, we, we aren't closing that feedback loop well enough. Yeah, I think that's where, um, not just you were talking about at the patient level, but also where payers and providers are going to start mm -hmm. to demand those things because it's just getting too costly. Not a not to know that, and b not to know who these drugs are working for and why or why not. And also, even when you start to adding things like combinations, and then outcomes over time. Um, so the whole essentially healthcare system from pharma to payers, providers has to come up with that infrastructure for sure. It actually is happening to some degree, um, but only in places where the governing body can get away with it. So ultimately what you're talking about is sort of being able to mine the EHR and give that data back to pharma so that they can build better drugs, yeah? Uh, there's lots of ethical questions, lots of legal, societal questions, and so on. Um, some of the big payers are doing it to a small degree, Geisinger a little bit, uh, Kaiser a little bit. These are sort of integrated payers that are starting to worry about this problem, and ultimately it's to drive the cost of healthcare down. And then um, there are, like the veteran program, they're talking about sequencing a million veterans. And you know, if you join the Army, they just sort of own your ass. So that, there's not much you can do about that. And then, of course, if you look outside of the United States, there are other countries that um, are talking about just, you know, flat out sequencing everybody there. So whether it's, it happens here in the U.S., whether it happens somewhere else, all this stuff is ultimately getting aggregated in some electronic health record. And in some organizations, in some uh, countries, uh, that actually will be driven back into research. It just depends sort of on the governing bodies. Another question from the audience here. Yeah, Lou Fiore from the uh, Boston VA, I'm one of the uh, PIs of the Million Veteran Program. Uh, we're looking towards big pharma to drive uh, this field, and I don't know if that's the right model. It seems to me that it should be clinical trials for genomics, not genomics and clinical trials. The problem, I think, is that the folks who are developing the diagnostics don't have the funding to do clinical trials for them. And until and, and if, uh, until and unless we develop an infrastructure where these different diagnostics are tried probably within the healthcare system in real time, embedded within the healthcare system rather than a separate apparatus. I think that personalized medicine is just really not going to happen. Mm -hmm. So just you're, you're, I think that the comments you're making about accessing EMR is exactly right on, and that's what we have to be focusing. Mm -hmm. Any thoughts on who should be leading the charge then? Pharma, CROs, or somebody else? Him. Him? You volunteering? <laughs> In, in fact, we, we have considered the, the VA just recently as, as potentially a good partner for this pre-screen patient registry, um, partly because of the access to the medical records, but also because of the third party. Because when we try to get some pharma companies together, cancer sites, it's very difficult to get everybody on the same page of doing the same thing. And so bringing in a third party may address certain challenges um, broadly, but also very specifically, such as ownership of IP. We have about 10 minutes left, something of that sort. So again, look, I'll take any more questions from the audience. We have a few more uh, from our online audience. Uh, one that's somewhat related to a question we had a minute ago. Um, do you have or are you aware of any tools that can query both genomic and clinical data? So I'll take that. <laughs> um, so that's actually the tool that we've built. Um, essentially, the, I mean, it, so there's kind of, I, I guess I view analytics sort of in two, two boxes. One is sort of what the data is and show me what it looks like. And the other is let's pull it all together and actually see what it can predict for you. Um, and so in trying to come up with ways to deal with both genomic and expression data, molecular data, proteomic, metabolomic, as well as clinical data, the approach that we've taken is 
uh, to reverse engineer network models of the system, network models that link up um, and try to uh, uh, predict the causal relationship between your genotype, molecular phenotype, and clinical phenotype. And you can do this now using um, reverse engineering tools from network biology that use global optimization, Bayesian network inference, as well as Monte Carlo simulation to, once you have the models, to actually simulate them and come up with predictions about biomarkers or new targets or new mechanisms. Um, but that's how, how we've done it. Okay. A uh, bunch of questions are coming in. So I'll, I'll look and we'll take one, I'll, you know, the, the best answer uh, to jump to the microphone. And, but if other people want to weigh in, uh, please do. Um, this is a good one. Uh, how would pharma handle variants of unknown significance in clinical trials? That could be a summing block. Go ahead, Brad. I've actually seen uh, that, that there is an interest in developing a, a database, a, a knowledge base of, of unknown variants, and yeah. especially as you move into a, a adaptive trial design, um, where you're really looking for um, some unknown mechanisms of action and, and selection biomarkers. And if you have a way to move those into your clinical trial um, rapidly, then it, it can be a benefit. Okay. Anyone else want to take that? Okay. How early in the trial phase should one incorporate genomic markers? We've touched on this, but do we jump in straight away? The, the, fo the folks that I talk to always say that um, if, you, if you're incorporating them after the trial has started, it's too late that it's really got to be straight through from discovery on, and that if you, if you start bringing them in with the trial design, then you may end up making some discovery, and now you've got to go back. If you've got to build a diagnostic, it's going to take two more years. You've only got five more years of patent life on the compound. The whole thing gets messy. And so, yeah, if you don't have the marker, the translational guys are asking for the markers, the genomic markers, out of the gate before they start the trial. And they rarely get it, I think. Agreed, it needs to be done early, but which also means you need to do the discovery early. So try to learn from the different model systems that you have, but as well as early uh, phase one or phase two A clinical trials where you're going to start to get samples and actually see what's happening in those patients and determine why some might or may not be responding on the molecular and genetic level. What about um, the issue of privacy? Is that a real issue or is that uh, something that you know, journalists like to sort of you know, raise uh, scares about? Um, do you see that as being a potential problem? I know, Toby, you were pointing out earlier that it's, you know, data, there's a de-identification dilemma because it's possible to infer a lot of information from some pretty raw data. There is, and I think, I, I, don't, I don't have a good sense of how much of a political problem it will be. Um, Europe has yet stronger privacy laws than we do, and we have some pretty um, restrictive laws around, around genomic data. Uh, not laws, but regulations around genomic data, at least from various agencies. Um, so I'm not sure how much it's going to cause a problem, but it could. Um, and again, if it's a small enough piece of data, if it's just a few markers, that's probably fine. Um, we don't really understand yet how much data you need to be identifiable. And that's the big question. Brad, any, any or Richard, any thoughts on... Definitely, this is a, a, a subject for a lot of discussion, and yeah. I think as we've heard, it, it's not clear um, what, what the standards and the regulations are and how they can be addressed. Um, and, and what I've seen is that after much discussion, perhaps you can get to the point where, okay, we need specific use contracts with those who have access. Um, perhaps that's a, the, the only solution. Or is it firewalls and limiting access? So I think it's, it's not clear, but there certainly is a lot of concern. Question for Richard. How many years away, I'm just saying it's for Richard, it's not, it doesn't say it's for Richard, but yeah, you can take it. Um, how many years away are we from having a complete genome sequence for 50% of the population? Oh, <laughs> uh, That's from online. Let's see, the capacity of the planet this year is about, it's somewhere around 50,000. We think it's going to maybe double next year, it's 100,000. Um, in five years, you might have, no, it's going to be 20, it's going to be 10, 15 years, I think, before you get that far, if not more. Because, by the way, of that capacity, an awful lot of it is going to sequencing corn. Which is good. Another question from the, go ahead. Okay, all right. Um, a couple more uh, quickly, and then I think we'll take the, the, the Marianne brings, uh, uses her prerogative to ask the, the final question to wrap up. Um, 
Two more questions from our online audience. Do you think, panel, the answer only lies in developing an end-to-end -end solution, integrating with other existing databases, for example, or would individual modules that answer different questions throughout the process be another way to provide answers? I think both. We'll see, and we'll see both happening. There are some that are going to take on the challenge of creating sort of the end-to-end -end solution, and then there's also going to be available uh, as more people take on the data management and analytics side of things, modules that address different pieces of the problem. Um, and we will need to see both solutions bear out before we see what, what will actually work. Okay. And uh, the last question from me. How do you, uh, from our online community again, how do you anticipate FDA approval of multiple gene markers for a specific therapeutic? Is that an issue? Yeah, no, I, I think right now they, they don't have a, a, a method in place or a, a guidance in place for how they would address a multi-analyte or a software-based um, diagnostic. Um, so I think that that's something that, you know, has been on the table for some time, um, but um, it's not, you know, they have other priorities, but, but you know, we're hoping in the next year or two we'll see some guidance. Uh, so last question, Marian Brown, CHI. All right. I, first, I want to just to say thank you to everybody. And uh, right now I want to turn the tables just a little bit. We really appreciate uh, the panel and sort of picking their brains for the last hour or so. But now I want to turn the table just a little bit and say, panelists, what do you need to see from the audience, from the audience here as well as the audience offline? Because you are talking to technology uh, appliers that are on the cutting edge of technology as well as those providers that are developing new platforms. So what would you like to see coming down the pike that the audience can provide for you all? Any order will do. One priority, and, and uh, my focus is oncology, is real-time monitoring. Um, so it's not enough to get that snapshot at initial um, diagnosis and that initial biopsy. We need real-time monitoring. We need, we need able to see the emergence of resistance clones, for example, um, and we need to be able to combine that with the clinical data. So I would say that that's a high priority. Mm, that's a cool question. I'm <laughs> I think it's, you can either be really specific with an answer to that question and then you sort of feel like you've left something on the table or you can be really general and then you feel like Nobody knows what the hell you're talking about, so I'll do the latter. <laughs> um, I think that it's easy to point out the challenges, and there are many, and that's what we do as a group of, of organized scientists. We point out the challenges, but um, like it or not, whether you're in it or not, whether you're, whether you're part of the revolution that's happening here or not, it's going to happen. And so I think when it gets to clinical trials and is it time for genomics to you know, sort of drive uh, the patient stratification of a trial. Maybe, maybe not. But that's no reason not to use genomics in trials. You just have to figure out what to use them for. And I think just generally, um, when there's a technology that's innovating as quickly as this, you want to grab onto its coattails and say yes all the time rather than no all the time. And whenever there's an issue that you've got to deal with, then you figure out a way to deal with it or you go around it. But I think if you don't do that, you're just going to be left out because there is a group of people that is acting that way. So um, I'd like to ask that there just be more thought in terms of getting to the actual result that you want from your biomarker analysis. So when you're designing your experiment and going after measuring lots of genes and lots of proteins and transcript that you take into that experimental design the analytics that you need to do. Because if you wait till the end, I've, I've heard bioinformaticians tell me over and over again that no one thought about what statistical tools are going to be used to analyze this data, and they're like, I can't apply anything to this data, because the biologists who did this experiment didn't think about the end of this. So to really think about the fact that if you're going to get anywhere, you're going to need to apply some big analytics to your big data, and to think of that ahead of time, and incorporate that into your experiments. I'm going to pass. <laughs> so going to pass. Uh, in that case, I'm going to say thank you to our friends at NGS Leaders for organizing this uh, stimulating panel discussion, Junon Quest as well for their support, Richard Resnick, Brad Smith, Aya Khalil, Toby Bloom. Please join me in thanking our panelists and thank you everyone online for listening.